First of all, thanks very much to Claudia for inviting me to, uh, to participate today. Um, my talk's very, very brief because I'm sure you'll have lots of questions to ask in the Q&A session. So first of all, I'm not here to talk about sort of philosophy, the philosophy and the fairness aspects of open access. It's not to say they're not important, but I'm an economist here. One, one, one lesson is that if you actually do want to help people who are less fortunate than you, then the best way to do that is to give them money. Um, <laughs> open access is, is not, it's not, I'm not, gonna hit, I'm not here to discuss it as a vehicle of redistributing wealth from people who have resources to people who have less resources. I'm here to discuss open access as a way of realizing efficient trades um, between the different people who are, the different stakeholders in the academic, in the academic uh, press. So as is mentioned, in the last 30 years, the price of basically peer review, which is the same, so once upon a time, journals did two things. They certified, like a peer review, and they disseminated. They actually had the printing presses. Nowadays, we don't really need them for the dissemination. We only really need them for the peer review. And in the last 30 years, the price of peer review has increased dramatically. Firstly, because there's been just a huge explosion in the volume of research. And so if you're just, as a scientist or an academic, you just don't have the time to sit there and read every single paper. You need to know which ones are more important. Um, so you need the peer review for that. And there's, there's more of that needs to be done when there's more research produced. And secondly, the cost of experts' time has gone up. Um, getting an, an, an academic's, what, what the, the, the kind of thing, the demands on an academic's time 50 years ago were less than they are now. So the cost has inescapably increased, and that's been uh, shown to you in plain view by, uh, by my colleague Joseph uh, a few moments ago. Um, now what that means, because what they're doing is the peer review, it's invalid to say something, even though it's tempting out of human nature, it's invalid to say something like, well I wrote this and I own this document so I should be able to distribute it, this paper to whoever I want. Because the certific a very important part of the value of the research that's been produced is the act of certification. Anyone's free to write an article and post it on their web page and, 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 and you can stop there. But you can't insist that it be certified by some of the best experts in the world and then claim that you did 99.9% .9 of the work and you should be able to hand it out to anyone you want. Okay, you can hand out your own stuff to anyone you want, but then you have to deal with the certification mechanisms that exist on the web. Some of the alternatives, like people linking to your blog and so on and so forth. And in some scientific situations, that's just not satisfactory. I'm sure I mean, a lot of my uh, colleagues blog you know, a lot of economics colleagues blog, and that's fine for discussing certain issues, but I'm sure you would agree, all agree that lots of biomedical research is not best addressed and disseminated through, and certified through blogging and people linking to blog posts. You need experts to read carefully and make sure that the, you know, drugs being tested and so on and so forth are being tested correctly. Now, the principle of trade in economics is very straightforward. It says if somebody's willing to pay some amount X for a good, and it costs some amount Y to deliver that good to them, and that Y, the, the cost of delivering the good to them is less than the amount that they're willing to pay, then there should be a trade. You should deliver that good to them. Now where the price of the trade depends on you know, various bargaining aspects, so it could be that the price ends up being much closer to the, the highest amount they're willing to pay, in which case most of the benefit of the trade comes from the person delivering, or it could be that the cost, the price is very close to the cost, in which case most of the benefit of the trade is realized but it is, 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 is uh, secured by the person receiving the good. But the surplus that, that exists there, the, the redistribution is a secondary issue. The first issue is realizing that trade. Okay, um, so that's what you need to be. That's what you need to have in mind. Now, in the digital age, post certification, after some peer reviews have checked this paper and said this is, you know, this is legitimate science. It's not shoddy work then the delivery cost in the digital age after this certification is zero, more or less. I mean, it's cents for the bandwidth access to someone's website or to some central repository. So that means that in principle, okay, any price above zero will prevent some kind of efficient trade from happening. Because if you have a price that's above zero, there's gonna be, when the delivery cost is essentially zero, anyone between the actual price, who values the good, anywhere between the actual price and zero will not be buying it and therefore will not be getting it, even though it costs zero to get it to them. However, as has been demonstrated by, the, um, by my colleagues and in, in the graphs and tables you've seen, there's a huge fixed cost that must be covered. Okay? And this cost, these very large fixed costs are covered in one of, in one of several ways. The main ways are either through reader fees, Okay, so you, you charge the readers, that's what we're used to. All the fees, which are some of the more recent things. 
private society fees, so you know, if you're a member of the American Economic Association, you pay a subscription fee, and part of that subscription fee subsidizes the dissemination of the American Economic Review. Um, and then taxation, general taxation, which goes to the government, and then the government subsidizes lots of these organizations. Now, you can show in a very ambiguous way, empirically, that for profits, controlling for the quality of the journal, and every aspect you can imagine in the quality of the journal, in terms of the number of pages, etc., citations, whatever you want, the for profits charge a lot more than non profits do for journals, okay, in terms of reader fees. That shouldn't come as a surprise to you. Um, there's a lot of for profits producing journals, there's a lot of non profits producing journals, and by non profits, I mean things. Organizations like the American Economic Association, which is a trade, you know, um, economic societies, and there's similar things in all, in all the sciences. Uh, now, because they charge a lot more, the reason they charge a lot more is because they're trying to make profit, uh, and that means that they are a bigger barrier to efficient trade um, than are non-profits. Okay. Now, so so that so that's sort of problem A in in a world where. You have lot for profits dominating um, or having a very large role in, in disseminating research. The fact that they're for profits is automatic and, and charging higher fees automatically means there's a lot of it, a lot of people who for whom we can realise surplus by letting them read, but they're not reading because they can't afford the reader fee. And that reader fee is way above what it needs to be to cover the costs because a non profit would ch charge a lot less for the same quality. Now the optimal mix of how to price, you know, you've got to pay for these fixed costs, these reviewers and so on and so forth. Now, you, whether you pay, how much you charge society via reader fees, via author fees, via society fees, via taxation, it really depends on, you know, on, on the specifics of each journal and the specifics of each field. Okay, if, you're, if you happen to be in an art, in, in a, basically what happens is that every time you raise one of these prices, you knock various people from that side of the market out of the market. And, the, and you've got to balance, do I want to knock low value readers out of the market by raising the reader price or do I want to knock, lock, uh, knock, knock out low, uh, low willingness to pay authors out of the market by raising the author fee? Now if you're doing biomedical research where you have grants that are millions of dollars then probably you don't need to, and, and, the art, and, and an article processing fee probably comes out to around $1,500 or $2,000 then that's such a trivial part of the grant you probably don't need to be too scared about raising author fees and putting reader fees down to zero. But in history, in the humanities, and social sciences, authors don't have grants that are millions of dollars. They don't have two grand to drop on an article. And so if you raise author fees and lower reader fees, you have to worry about, now there's not going to be any authors contributing to the journal, and even though we've increased the number of readers. So the optimal mix is very field-specific um, and very journal-specific. Now, for-profits tend to be reluctant to use author fees, or have been reluctant to use author fees. And there are some complicated reasons for this, but part of it really comes down to the idea that the way a journal generates money is through its status. And status is a very sort of ephemeral and fragile um, uh, property that journals have. And they're very scared of doing anything. You know, if nature and science are the two best journals in science. If we all woke up tomorrow and agreed to think that science and nature are rubbish, then nobody would submit there, and then they would instantly become worthless. Okay, so very fragile, that's not going to happen, but it's very fragile, their status, and they're very keen to not undertake any activity that might, you know, knock them from their high status. Uh, and so, author fees have become associated for various reasons with a, with, a, with a different way of disseminating research, and they're scared that it might scare away good authors. And so they don't do that, and they keep, it, keep all the uh, fees on reader fees, but now we're seeing a bit of a transition. The other technique, of course, that I mentioned was taxation. General taxation can fund these kind of things. I think general taxation, it's attractive to any small organization because it's a one way of spreading the society across, across, across the entirety of society. But I think, generally speaking, using government taxation to fund these kind of things is a bad idea. And essentially, the most reason it's a bad idea is, first of all, because it usually stifles innovation. Uh, when you have a guaranteed source of income that you're going to get, no matter what the quality of your outcome, that doesn't, that doesn't generate most of the innovations in journals come from people who are having to bear the cost themselves. And secondly, it really encourages wasteful lobbying by all sorts of stakeholders on the government. So really, the best, I think the best solution for assessing the optimal mix of fees that journals can ask, can charge or should charge, uh, and for the best way of disseminating research, is just to do what we see now, which is you let everyone do whatever they want, some journals like PLAS are doing open access and charging author fees. 
Some journals like those by Elsevier do reader fees mostly. Whatever, have the whole spectrum. Let's have, let's have some competition and, and see what comes out and what people prefer. We could sit here and have a debate. You know, there's a lot of, for example, there's a lot of tablets on the market now. There's like an iPad and a Galaxy and all these different things. We could sit here and have a huge debate about which one's the best, or we could just put all of them available in the market and see which one people use the most and which one actually ends up being, you know, <coughs> being serves people's needs the best. So I recommend, if I, if I, if I was in somehow in centralized command, I would say, I would say, let all these different mechanisms and all these argue, let, let the market resolve which one of these things is the best. And secondly, emphasize private funding, especially via society. So a lot of these journals are funded by private societies and the fees of the members. Um, I would emphasize using those journals, um, uh, using the funding that way in order to best allow the competition to, 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 to declare the genuine winner, so to speak. Um, so that's all I wanted to say in terms of the economics, and I guess I'll hand back to the uh, organizers for Q&A.